Intrigue around Westminster's corridors of power on BBC One in just over ten minutes, Ian Richardson stars in the acclaimed political drama House of Cards. This is BBC Two. In a moment, we'll be handing you over to a man whose style of humour has been described as both outrageous and shocking. A brand new series. Victor Lewis Smith, over to you. You're watching BBC Two, where we go over to the hospital for distressed broadcasters. Now sit back, hold on to your chairs, and um, listen to that. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's BBC One, our next-door neighbours. The walls are paper thin. They're having another bloody party. I've told them before. I've said, if you want to have a party, OK, but give us some notice. Listen to them. He's inconsiderate. That's it. I'm going to bang on the wall with my shoe. Shut that bloody racket up, will you? Sod off. Don't you tell me to sod off, you bunch of yobbos. Do your parents know you're having a party? None of your business. It is my business, you rabble. We're all posh at BBC Two. We've, we've got Umberto Echo coming round later. What's he going to think? Hearing Chris Tarrant and Noel Edmonds blaring through from next door. You lower the tone of the neighbourhood, you do, with your crappy quiz shows and your pop music showing us all up. Shut it now! This is BBC Two. Time for... Shut up! It's serious, I'm afraid. They did their best in the ambulance. Gave him artificial respiration. Only wish they'd given him real respiration. But with the cuts, artificial is all they can afford nowadays. Well, I got here as soon as I could, but it's not an easy place to find, is it? Yes. Well, we like to keep St. Reeds very private. We don't like the public to see what happens to our patients. Whenever you hear a BBC spokesman say that some broadcast or other hasn't been sacked, but is, uh... Enjoying the well-earned rest. Mm. They've been dumped here with the BBC's human garbage disposal unit. But remember, walls have ears. That's why I never eat their sausages. <laughs> Scriptwriter, gone to pieces. The BBC owns this huge hospital, you see. Mostly burnt-out TV people. Used to hang out at all the hip joints. Now they're just fitted with plastic ones. They've usually been involved in some scandal or other. And of course we do a lot of heart attack comedians seen here having a joke with the nurses for the tabloids. Uh, in here. He'll be dead before the day's out. But are they all people off the tally? Well, there are some civilians used for documentaries about bone marrow disorders, kidney transplants, that sort of thing. We'll evict them all in the spring when that's life finishes. We also get the kind of principled actors who swear they'll never do voiceovers for ads, darling. But one by one, they succumb. Soft, strong and very long. I've worked with Trevor now, and I don't have to do this, but I do like the product. Can I have the money now, please? You see? Next thing you know, they're doing commercials for Napalm. The hypocrisy dawns on them eventually. I suppose they'll all leave in the end when they get better. You mad? Or both? Never. Do you hear me? Never. They must not get out. Any of them. Where to, Governor? Take me to the BBC hospital urgently. Uh, what are you talking about? What? You're already in the hospital. I don't understand. Well, Governor, your body's on a life support machine inside St. Reeves. Yeah. And we're inside your body. I'll oh. switch on my full beam. You can see it. Look. Oh. There's your veins. Veins. There's your giblets. Giblets. There's your blood. There's your gut. Gut. your heart and homorphous psychic blob. Blob. Being driven round your own body. Body. Right. Well, head for my head. Right. I want an out-of-body experience. Any exit will do. Just hit the gas. Uh, what? Hey, get your game. What? You're just using me as a narrative linking device. No. That'll be double on the meter, Governor. 
Is that my heart up ahead there? Yeah, <laughs> there's one way traffic system up there. We'll oh. be stuck for hours if we go through the ventricles. Oh. I'll take the bypass. Is that all right? That's all fine. How did you get in this mess? Well, to tell you that, I'd have to have a flashback and I'd have to go all wobbly and flashback, that. Governor. Mm. That's extra on the meter. That is for flashback. That doesn't matter. I'll still go all wobbly, 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 wobbly. I started off in radio. It was my job to pick the thyme pips from the lush vineyards of Greenwich each morning. They only use fresh thyme pips at the BBC, never frozen. Then I got into TV. I had the worst jobs there too. Remember the old-fashioned tellies and the little white dot on the set at closed down? And cool. That was me. I used to have to dress up in a round white suit every evening, stand in a pitch black field and run away from the camera as fast as I could while going boo. Then I had another terrible job. I was the BBC Revolving Globe. I had to spend four hours a day in makeup while they painted a map of the world on my face, and I had to stand on an old Danset record player turntable revolving at 16 RPM while the orchestra played the national anthem. See my chin? That was Antarctica. I was the body in the body in question. That's my livery pulled out on the slab. I worked my guts out for that program. It was Victor Louis Smith. I even bribed stars to mention my name on chat shows. Finally, I took a job as the car park attendant at TV Centre so I could stand in front of the security cameras and pretend I'd been given my own series. It was going to be called Lots of Cars and Me. The first day of shooting arrived, so I set off for the TV Centre car park on my 1,000cc motorbike. Kitty stabiliser wheels attached for added safety. But unfortunately, the worst thing that can happen to anybody when they're on a motorbike it happened to me. <laughs> Bandaged, head to foot in hospital bed. Uh, tragic, Gov. Mm. Uh, don't mind if I turn my radio on, do you, Gov? No, no, you go ahead, please. Right. Mm. You're a sexy little radio. Oh. I'd like to fiddle with your knobs and stick my tongue in your c cassette slot. Oh, no. How about some mid-air refueling radio? No. Sorry, Gov, I wasn't turning my radio on. I'm a bit of a literalist myself. Literalist, yes. Will you drive, please? Fair enough. Brace yourself. <laughs> Here's Victor! <laughs> What exactly is wrong with him? Uh, amnesia, aphasia, broken back, bruising, a coma, concussion, dislocation, dysphasia, and that's just A to D. But mostly it's a comic coma. And still, he's looking well in himself. He always said he wanted some me time. Heart rending. Look, I know how traumatic this must be for you. Wives of TV stars are no less sensitive than anyone else. And no doubt you want to ask me quite a lot of questions. The most common at this stage is, can he still shag and write checks? No, it's okay. We've got a joint account. What about, you know, down the front and round the back? Uh, he won't have to bother with that. We've taken out his colon. So much of it, in fact, that he's virtually a comma. Never mind coma. It's a standard op here. TV stars are like the royal family. They never go to the toilet, so no worries there. The sarcastic dialysis machine does it all for him. What? It takes the piss out of him. <laughs> Forgive me, a little medical student humor gives great solace at such grim times. Why is there a telly on his life support machine? We're trying to stimulate his subconscious by playing TV programs to him. Yourself disco dancing. It's worth a shot. Can he hear us, do you think? It's a game, isn't it, this, eh? Oi, mm. see that little clot on the wall of your carotid artery there? Clot? It doesn't look like much to me. <laughs> nah, not now, no. Mm. Yeah, but in 24 years' time, mm. that little clot, that's going to kill you, that is. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Not that I think you'll recover from the crash myself, Governor. Mm. Hip, hip, hooray. Yeah, in fact, if you want my opinion... No, I don't want your opinion, yeah, actually. If you want no. my opinion, fashion-wise, Governor, mm. fashion-wise, mm. you know what you'll be wearing next season? Tell me, a oh, wise one. Yeah. Dirt and pine, mate. Mm, charming. <laughs> hey, charming. I've done the knowledge, Governor. Mm. Not much you can tell me. I don't mind telling you. Mm, I've noticed. Dirt and pine. Dirt and pine. <laughs> hey, dirt and pine. Dirt and pine. The I Spy Book of Animals. Number one, pets as Christmas presents. These are frequently bought by people with IQs marginally lower than the pet they've just purchased. This is the dream...
This is the reality. Within hours, even the most stupid owners realize that what they've actually bought for Kylie and Jason is not an adorable pet, but two piles of dung with a 5,000 decibel speaker attached every day for life. Which is why, by Boxing Day, the motorways of Britain are full of tattooed men opening the rear doors of their cars and saying to their pets, See that bone over there what looks like a coach going at 80 miles an hour in the outside lane? Fetch! Number two, the cart horse. This uh, early edition of uh, Animal Magic, narrated by Johnny Morris, never made it uh, on air. It's easy to see why such disgraceful footage was deemed unfit for broadcast. The farmer on the left wasn't in equity. Shocking. Number three. We all know the sounds that British animals make. Dogs go woof woof, ducks go quack, cows go moo, and cats also go woof if you soak them in paraffin and set them alight. I'm sorry. Cats, of course, go meow. But browse through children's books around the world and you'll discover that not all animals speak English. In Poland, for example, cats go grillip grillip. In Bolivia, cows go or go or go. In India, ducks go jahan jahan jahan. And in China, dogs go sizzle sizzle. On account of the fact that most are frying in bite sized chunks in a pecan black bean sauce. Hmm, good and tasty. And there's Benjamin Britten with his collection of queen bees. And here's another shot of a dog dressed up in fashionable clothes. Where were we? Oh, yes. Oh, Carpi in Botswana go. In Goa, snakes go. Los Angeles pigs go. Get in the back of the van. I'm sorry, that should read. There is a TV camera on. We advise you on your rights as a citizen. Number three people who stuff dead animals. A bizarre hobby, but not quite so bizarre as. People who stuff live animals. Indeed, who can forget the Cambridge rabbit rapist who terrorized an entire woman for months? Oh, yes, in Latvia, bison go brozhnetsky brozhnetsky, while in Tierra del Fuego, rattlesnakes go and in Malta, disabled centipedes go da 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 Number four, cutesy wootsy animals. Many years ago, cinema newsreels used to be full of maudlin sentimental tosh about animals living peacefully together when nature dictated they ought to be eating each other instead. Worst of all, the filmmakers never showed what happened after the director's head cut. For the cat and dog, it was just another photo opportunity. But for the budgie, <laughs> it was a snuff movie. <laughs> Something to cheer you up. It's that model aeroplane you made. Well, I know it's your favourite. Thought you might like to have it here. Can you hear me? Much better. And do you want a quick drag? I bet you would, wouldn't you? Well, I probably shouldn't, but... a fit load on your husband's protruding knob, oh. Most importantly, that there's no penetrators of smoke in his orifundable. There's a deep poly in that. And furthermore, this deep bow for lolliper. Little tweaky tuffalo down on the rotating wang load in the engine and bobs your uncle throw there. Oh, joy. Why are you talking like that? I honestly can't answer that question, madam. I spoke like this once for the BBC 35 years ago, and they've kept me doing it ever since. And that's why I'm in the hospital too. Now, if you'll excuse me, ho, ward number four and the surgeon's through, and this call will be half hours through.
Lockwood v. Nurse. Please go to Ward F. Mr. Lobley is coming up with another invention. Quickly stop in Nurse before he comes up with another invention. Bong bing. Nurse, there's no lemon in my chins, man. You know what I'm going to do when I get out of here, Nurse? I'm going to make millions from the post office. And how will you do that, Mr. Lovely? When you take your parcels down to the post office, they weigh them and charge you the appropriate fee. But suppose you put a helium-filled balloon in the parcel, then the parcel would be lighter than air. Take that to the post office, they'd weigh it and find it was minus 10 ounces. And if it's minus 10 ounces, then the post office will owe me money. Round 10 quid, I reckon, first class. And how much do you think a canister of helium costs, then? Well, here's the really clever bit, nurse. I'd address the parcel to myself. So as soon as the postman delivered it, I could take it to another post office and get more money. I'd take the same parcel to every post office in the country. There are 30,000 post offices in the country, nurse. Ridiculous. Nurse. I've told you before, Mr. Lobley, you really mustn't try and eat the pillows. <laughs> I'm afraid you just don't pass muster. You're in for the duration. A dozen mogadon. You're late on your rounds this morning. Piss off. Fair enough. Jockey. My postman's crappy should be walking through my gate. Surprisingly enough, he's very, very late. Well, what's 12 hours anyway? Early in the morning. Well, not very early in the morning. In fact, sometimes at the crack of noon. With letters sent in March, but delivered in June. As he whistles some moronic tune. <whistles> he's as popular with me as a fart in a crowded lift. You're bone idle, you are. Here's a telegram. I opened it in error. Opened in error? Ah, it was a lot of it in Dublin. That's in error. I had it in my pocket and I read it. Anyway, it says your mother's dead. Huh? She's kicked bucket. Oh, my God! No, don't worry. They buried her weeks ago. I've been in my pocket for two months. No! My postman's crap, my postman's dross. When it comes to my packages, he couldn't give a toss. Folds in half my letter that says photographs do not bend. I say, look, it says photographs do not bend. They bloody well do bend, my friend. Down at the sorting office, they play football without a ball. They use parcels labelled fragile glass. And they head them against a wall. Jimmy, go on, kick it. Nice one. What's in this one anyway? Stained glass. Oh, well, if it's stained, no one's going to care, are they? Go. Nice one. Edney. Oi, don't go. There's a parcel here for Cambridge. Cambridge, 1939. Excuse me, could you come back in five minutes after I've had my lunch, please? family tree, a tree on whose interweaving branches we are, each of us, but a single leaf. Who can say when those leaves will blossom, where the winds of fate will blow them, or where they will fall? Tonight we celebrate two such lives, in kith and kin. I've had my lunch. Cambridge, 1939. And the brilliant philosopher Bertrand Russell had just completed his PhD, proving by a process of pure logic that anyone who has been to an Oxbridge University always mentions it within eight minutes of arriving at a dinner party. It teaches you to view actions that seem to you obviously absurd as inevitable. Hilda Baker, the glamorous founder of St. Hilda's College, persuaded Russell to adapt his uncompromising brand of philosophical empiricism for the musical stage, advising him to cut down on the pure logic and go for the teeth, tits and tinsel and plenty of underwear. It was during his production of the Principia that he met Jane. What do you enjoy reading, Professor Russell? inquired the starlet. John done poetry. I think you mean John did poetry. Russell was impressed by her grasp of syntax. Thank you.
Within weeks, Jane and Bertrand Russell were wed. A string of successes followed. His next musical, Do People in Glockamora Wonder How Things Are Over Here, was his greatest success to date. The distinguished musicologist Mervyn Briggs explains why. The Hollywood director, Busby Barclay, persuaded Jane and Burton to sign a five-year contract with MGM in Hollywood. Their arrival was headline news in Variety, the world's only spinning newspaper. You do it by winding up the elastic band and spinning it. There it goes. Lovely. Burton took Tinseltown by storm. His first musical, An Inquiry into Meaning and Truth with Ten Luscious Lovelies, caused an overnight sensation and soon went into production at MGM with a score by Lawrence Welk and a cast that included Roy Rogers and Trigger. Never in the history of philosophy had so much leg been revealed in the pursuit of ontological truth. Meanwhile, Jane starred in his film version of Albert Camus' novel about an existentialist with big tits. L'étranger, le étranger, l'étranger, le étranger, the outlaw. And he was determined to provide her with an adequate support for this new role. Working together with Philip Oppenheimer and a team of engineers at Los Alamos, he used his mathematical prowess to develop a series of foundation garments that shook the world of underwear science to its core. He was trying to get a seamless bra. And uh, it was a good idea, and he was ahead of his time, as usual. But uh, it was a contraption. The marriage ended. The bubble burst. The dream collapsed, the stupid moustache, the old-fashioned glasses, the cliché dip... Ow! Heartbroken, Bertrand returned to Cambridge to take up the chair in deconstruction. A joke he found singularly unamusing. One more for the road. Jane turned to drink and was last seen squatting in the dream house at the Ideal Home exhibition. Tragically... Bertrand never knew that he had a son, and... Hello, Mum. Mm. So, pardon? Because of them, I've become quite a controversial figure. There are those who say I look like my father, dear Bertrand. I suppose it's the shock of white hair we share. While another camp insists I resemble my mother, dear Jane. I suppose... it's my baby blue eyes. <laughs> He's quite something, isn't he? I love him in tight bandages. How did it happen? Motorcycle crash. Very nasty. Is he uh, still wearing leathers under his bandages? Here we go again. It's the police. The police? It's okay. It's not about your ultrasound and Mazzola parties. They want to see the wife. The police! are here to see you. It's all right. They're not the real police. They're the BBC police. We like to keep it in-house. Don't worry, ma'am. We'll only ask him gentle questions. Whether he likes raindrops on roses, whiskers on kittens, that sort of thing. You see, we're not all thugs, ma'am. We're nice. Wholesome, caring, sharing people. Me, for example, I'm sensitive. I like the simple pleasures. I like nothing better than going down a park and watching the children shouting, jumping up and down, running about in all directions, screaming. Well, how can they know I'm only firing blanks? <laughs> but to business, madam. I need to take some details. Were there enemies? Well, the cut never liked him. Bit of a rabble rouser, was he? Used to like to smash up hotel rooms, did he? Not exactly. Not exactly, but... Well, they'd often leave the hot water running longer than was necessary. Anarchist. I'm starting to get the picture. This is fun, isn't it? <laughs> Bing bong. Could the restraining unit please proceed to the music therapy wing where the BBC Big Band are starting up with an old TV theme tune? Stop them. Bong bing. <laughs>
support machines malfunction. What's the matter with it? Technically, it's buggered. It's that monitor. Should be showing the brain scan, but look. That's impossible. Maybe it's the wiring that's wrong. No? Peculiar, isn't it? It's like looking through one of those spy holes in doors. You always think it's Barry Manilow on the landing. Seldom is, though. Well, here's one for the Lancet. Good, blimey, you've had quite a week, man. Chick Governor. Motorcycle crash, comedy coma. Comedy coma, yeah. that's right, lying in a BBC hospital. hospital yeah. Hoovering between life and death. Yeah. Sorry, hovering between life and death. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You've had your Bertrand Russell. Russell, that's right. My brain's been saturated with old television pictures. Pictures, yeah. Mm. I like that Stanley Hunwin. Mm. Overjoyedly to meet the bold you. <laughs> <laughs> and I seem to be turning into a human video playback machine. It's most peculiar. Yeah, it's peculiar. Mm. Of course, the worst thing for you is mm. your wife only cares about your money. You're right. My alter ego must lash out. It must lash. Lash! Lash! Uh, no, oh, hello. Um, I saw your ad in the newspaper, um, you know, with the massage. Right. Said no time wasters. Right. Quite, I quite understand that. I've had that myself. Right. I put an ad to sell a, a mummified Latvian bat penis, and I had a load of time wasters, I can tell you. On the phone all the time. Uh, time. I can imagine, actually. Yeah, you don't need it. No, anyway, let me give you some details. Right. The thing is, I, I don't have my own transport, so that does limit me on, on visiting... <laughs> oh, sorry, I wandered off. Uh -huh. um, could, could you I hold on a second? Sorry, there's somebody at the door. Yeah, could yeah, you sure, hold on, sure. Oh, hello. Um, I'll have the usual 400 tons with all the heads off. Thanks. <laughs> sorry to waste your time. It was a dog meat man. That's okay. Anyway, though. Did you, um, if you don't put no time wasters down, what do they do? Do they, uh, do you get a lot of, you know, do you get a lot of calls? Well, the answer to your question is no. I, I've never actually. Yeah, hold on a second. Ch no. Sorry, hold on a second. Yeah. Tracy! Tracy, leave Butch alone, will you? Sorry about that. It's my three-year-old daughter, Butch, being taunted by our um, Rottweiler, Tracy. Okay. About your ad about the time-wasting thing. Well, I tell people just phone on the day. Because yeah. Could you? Uh, could you? Oh, sorry. Sorry about this. My wife's just come in. Right. Hello. What? I'm busy. I'm talking to the man who put the ad in. The one who said he didn't want the time wasters. Oh, and another thing. The neighbours have been complaining about all the noise you make during sex. So you're not going round there anymore. Do you hear me? I don't think there's any point in continuing the conversation. Please, please, please don't p uh, put the phone down on me. Well, I, I'm the alter ego of someone in a comedy coma. I'm nasty. My family crest is two maggots rampant over a bucket of sick. Waste my time. 